Well, good afternoon. Welcome to another Friday. Here we are. Hey, Mac. Hey, Pete. And uh, joining us today, Ike Zimbel from uh, north of the uh, United States border, uh, coming from Chicago. Ike, you are officially behind the cheddar curtain. Uh, so that's for anybody who cares. That means anything that is Wisconsin or further north is behind the cheddar curtain. So welcome. We are always happy to have our uh, our friends from uh, from the north joining us. And uh, obviously, uh, if you've watched any of uh, our other episodes, uh, Ike has uh, showed up both randomly as a presenters and as uh, a guest question answer. You see his uh, shirt there from uh, Radioactive Systems. Um, Ike obviously is um, a uh, our. Uh, RF specialist, right? This is the passion that RF uh, that Ike has, but it's also uh, like everybody in this industry. I bet if we ask Ike, "Hey, what did you get in this business to do?" Coordinating microphones probably wasn't necessarily the exclusive thing. Yet here we are, and that's what's so cool about our business. But uh, before we get to that, um, you know, uh, we got the audience joining us. Uh, Mac and Pete, you guys had an unbelievable session on Wednesday with Sam and Julie around uh, show good. calling. Holy cow. That, that was Man. good. But I, I thought the reason we got in this business was the catering. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, it was yeah. about the chicken, right? Yeah, it was oh, all about the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> what, you don't like the lasagna 5,000 <laughs> times? Yeah. <laughs> It's Tuesday. Yeah. It's tacos. It's Mexican night. Yeah. There you go. Um, but uh, you know, uh, uh, we've we've certainly over the past weeks um, uh, we've focused heavily on RF because not just because that's stuff that we all have uh, a passion for, but more importantly, it's the one thing that is a, a recurring thread through every single job we do, whether broadcast, whether live event, whether theater you name it, RF is is crucial. And, uh, you know, Pete, we were talking a little earlier today about um, we're, we're almost, um, do I use the word spoiled? We're, we're, we're spoiled um, compared to, you know, back 20, 30 years ago, where um, the, the RF count we have now and the ease of doing certain things um, just were not possible. And I think it's really cool. Um, that said, uh, we're going to be moving into the next generation of of technology that, you know, I think a lot of people are like, well, we won't need RF coordinators anymore. Well, actually, you will. Don't worry about that. Um, what we what you know, I like the term we were talking about before RF managers or, you know, you're you're going to a coordinator isn't just about giving out a frequency, but but maybe even helping you understand the limitations of systems that you have that have very little user um, control. And going forward, a lot of products are gonna have less and less user control. And the importance of RF coordination or management is, is actually gonna go up in my opinion. Uh, but we can save that for a debate later on today. Um, but uh, Mac, Pete, why don't we uh, kind of get people, uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to have some questions at the end of this one. So uh, uh, any uh, thoughts on uh, conversations today? Well, uh, looking at the list, I don't know that I have to give my little question speech. It's uh, I don't a lot of familiar you names do, do there, but I'll go ahead and do it anyway for the one or two who may not, may not have. Uh, it, it's a tradition, Mac. Yeah, may not have been down this road before. Uh, questions are submitted in writing in your go to webinar control panel. There's a little pull down menu that says questions. And if you click on that to, to open it up at the bottom, there's a line where you can submit questions. Only the panelists and organizers see the questions unless we respond to one of them to everyone. And then it, you, you'll see it, but generally we don't type in type in the answers, we'll answer them verbally. Um, please be specific in your questions because they will not, almost guaranteed they will not be answered in a timely manner in that, that they will be some 
number of minutes after you ask that question is when we'll get around to, to pr addressing it. And it may not be clear what you were talking about if you're not specific about exactly what the question is about. And the same thing goes for comments. If you want to make a comment, be specific or it's really totally out of context. Um, we will try to answer every question. If we don't get to every question, we'll try to cover every topic in the questions. Um, so if, if we don't uh, answer your questions specifically, hopefully we will answer enough of it in answering someone else's question. Uh, that's about it for me. Um, I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be um, stuff we really going forward have to, to have to be aware of and and maintain equipment properly and and prep it properly. And I'm looking forward to this. Organization. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it too. Um, there is a uh, uh, the full show deck is available in handouts if you would like to get it for a reference later and it will be available with the copy of the video which we're back to norm now we didn't do it for the last show the master class we are recording um i will say that today is the beginning of our sponsor week for people who listen to us to give us a little bit of support and we will send one of these handsome little spray bottles out to you <laughs> for anybody who gives us more than $25 a month. Um, this is not full of perfume, but it's full of sanitizer, which unfortunately is the new perfume. So we're <laughs> stuck with it. Anyway, um, excited to get started with this. I, it's all yours. Okay. Well, um, I guess um, you guys must be really, really nervous because um, I know I am. Um, just uh, wanted to say a couple things before we start. First of all, I just want to thank uh, Kelly and Pete and Mac for doing this. I think that uh, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to be on here and also uh, having watched a lot of these webinars and everything, uh, what you guys have done for the industry in terms of just uh, collecting and aggregating just the people that we've been able to listen to and everything has been uh, just a really great thing. And I, I, really appreciate it and uh i have contributed and I, I i encourage everyone else to do that so moving on shop prep for rf um a few kind of ground rules before we start um we all know about best practices uh there are many many uh workshops webinars whatever that go on articles that cover best practices and it's good to know best practices uh, but sometimes it's good to know them just so you know that you're not doing them. Um, this is going to be um, descriptions of best practices, and uh, but also with the understanding that not everybody is a professional RF company and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, in some cases, it's just good to have the information and then do your best. So uh, don't be intimidated by anything you hear. Uh, starting with the first slide, uh, I get the uh, Ike and Tina Turner thing so often that I just happen to just decide to riff on that. Anyway, moving on. So, shop prep. What is the goal? What is it that we're trying to accomplish when we're packing a show? And um, I think this really also there's, um, I, I think, a very wide variety of people in the industry that may find themselves uh, pulling and packing an RF package. Um, they can be very junior people, um, or they can be, you know, people, for example, if you're uh, lucky enough, someone like me, if I'm lucky enough to actually get called in and have the shop days to put my own kit together. Uh, doesn't always happen, and it's one of the reasons I'm doing this workshop in the hopes of other people learning some of the things that I would like to see when I get a kid out on the show. So the goal is a complete functional RF package that will deploy at the job site with no surprises. And surprises can be anything from something that didn't get a power cord stuck in it and doesn't turn on to 
uh, cables that don't work or have the wrong ends on them or uh, stands that don't lock in place, that kind of stuff. So we're going to try and eradicate those things in the course of uh, building a show. Some of the touchstones of my approach are uh, consistency is really, really important. And that is that you know all systems that are the same work the same. So if you've got you know 16 channels of Axiant Digital or something like that, and 15 of them are set to line level and one of them set to mic level because a switch got missed, um, that's, that's not a good thing. So that's the kind of thing that we're gonna try and uh, help people figure out how to not make little slip ups like that. Um, accuracy is the input output all patch correctly. Uh, there's nothing that slows things down on a show more than saying, well, it's not coming out number six. Let me see if somebody put number nine in that jack instead and, and that kind of thing. So um, making sure that that's all been done properly. Um, moving on to documentation. What have you built? It's one thing to have uh, a rack full of gear and some cable trunks full of cable and antennas and whatever. And it's quite another thing to have all that documented. Uh, both, um, I should mention that I managed a PA company for most of the 1990s. So things like keeping track of inventory going in and out uh, is something that I care deeply about. And uh, I care about it in other people's shops too. So partly it's from a, a business perspective of keeping track of what's going to what show and that kind of thing. And partly from a show perspective, it is having the show documented on paper or what passes for paper these days on computer or whatever, uh, because basically every setting, every setting that gets used um, in, this, in this business, in this show, is it's either words or numbers. And there's really no excuse for not keeping track of those words and numbers. Um, so that you have a record of it, which brings me to repeatability. Could you build the same system again if required? Well, why would you be required to build the same system again? Well, nothing bad ever happens with trucks. Or no, wait, wait, it does. Sometimes trucks break down. Sometimes the drivers go to uh, Rochester, Michigan instead of Rochester, New York, or um, that, that actually happened once. I know about that one. Um, or the truck has an accident or your rack goes off the loading dock or gets a forklift fork put through it or something else. And if you have the documentation, uh, if you have that every setting uh, saved and uh, documented, then you know if some other equipment has to come in in a hurry, you can punch that all in without having to think about Oh, you know, what was I doing with this and what was I doing with that and that kind of thing. Same thing also applies if you're touring, for example, and somebody who's very, very rich says, hey, I want you to play at my daughter's wedding and you have to go and uh, work on a totally sub-rented system in Kazakhstan or something like that to have all of the uh, the vocal levels, the the pad levels, the microphone levels, all that kind of stuff documented. It's uh, it's important and it's helpful. So, starting with the hardware. In all devices, check the firmware and update all to the same version. Now, I put an asterisk next to that because that is actually a call that has to be made by whoever owns and is managing the equipment. Um, for example, I know that uh, Claire Brothers, for example, is extremely careful with uh, console software updates uh, and they have people go through them in the shop uh, until they're absolutely satisfied that the new version of whatever is suitable to be deployed to all consoles and so on. So there may be that sort of thing with uh, RF systems as well. From a practical standpoint, if you have uh, 
12 of the same receiver, for example, and you go through and you find a couple of them that have a different uh, revision of firmware on them than the other two, then you should bring that to the attention of the supplier and uh, request that they, uh, you know, get all all 12 of them on the same version. Why is that important? Uh, well, there's two reasons. The first reason is that if you're out in the field and you have to call the manufacturer for technical support, the very first question that they're going to ask you is, what version of firmware is it? Because these days, the firmware is the device. And the other reason that it's important is because the firmware is the device. And these um, firmware revisions don't just fall out of a hat. They don't just uh, make them up for no reason. They typically have some change in the parameters of the device, and it could be several changes in the parameters of the device. Um, anything from sort of minor things like adjusting the upper upper end of the frequency span that they'll tune to to uh, to meet 600 megahertz regulations to something much more um, drastic like adding a high density mode uh, like the uh, the Sennheiser uh, Digital 6000 just added that so that's a pretty major revision and so the fact is is that if you have units that have different firmware in them then you really have different devices so back to the thing about consistency uh, that you definitely want to have all of your devices that are the same make and model to be on the same version of firmware. So then once you have them all on the same version of firmware, do a factory reset. Why do a factory reset? Because uh, just like any other uh, computer-driven device these days, it's very, very difficult to look at the front panel, for example, and see all of the parameters. There could be some uh, selection ticked off deep down in some submenu somewhere that's making it behave differently than other units. So you want to clear all that so that when you start to program it with your um, chosen parameters, that uh, you know that you're not actually leaving something else inside that that is uh, some way that you don't want it to be. So once you reset the firmware, then it's time to reset all the hardware's hardware. And that is things like mic line switches, ground lift switches, and any other physical controls of that nature. Um, my chosen, my preferred uh, settings for those kind of things is all ground lift switches in the ground position and all mic line switches in the line position. Um, the reason for that is uh, if you are using a mic level output from the receiver um, and going into a mic level input on a mixing console, then you're basically padding down the line level output of the mixer. So you're inserting a pad, so you're adding more electronics, and then you're adding gain at the mixer end. And if it's in line level, then that is uh, not necessary to do that. So you're basically uh, have uh, less loss at the, at the receiver end, less gain at the mixer end, and it should be a cleaner, quieter um, signal path if you use line level. But again, that's actually up to the engineers that are using the stuff. So sometimes uh, as an RF technician, I don't necessarily get a say in that, but that's what I generally see happen. Um, next, you wanna establish a system, a table for IP addresses. I'll show you, I use Excel. I'll show you this later on in the presentation, uh, but uh, I address devices in groups and leave gaps for changes and additions. So uh, group one might be uh, receivers, for example, um, and they might be 10, 10, 10, 01 to 20, for example. And then I might leave a gap uh, to 30 or even 40, and then, for example, have in-ear transmit in transmitters start at 10, 10, 10, 41, and so on. 
so that you have room to add other pieces into the system if you need to and have them be at the same um, in the same set of uh, IP addresses. Um, check all the hardware for physical integrity. The other thing that I do, uh, not so much for a living anymore, but I've done quite a bit of it, is repair audio equipment. And you would be amazed at how often I've had equipment come in that the main problem is that the front panel is about to fall off. Um, so there are a lot of devices will typically have four screws that hold the front panel to the chassis. Check those four screws and tighten them up. I guarantee 90% of the time you'll at least at least get a quarter turn out of them. Uh, other devices have uh, L brackets that are rack ears that go on the sides of them. And sometimes they are a secondary L bracket that goes in behind the existing front panel. Either way, it's extremely common for those uh, to have loose screws in them as well, there in the sides. Also, uh, devices that have front handles on them, the handles typically screw in from the back of the front panel, and uh, they're often loose as well. And once you put the piece of equipment in the rack, you can't get to those to tighten them up. So uh, particularly if you're- Five dollars, we'll send them a bottle, including if you're sending um, if you're sending stuff out for uh, a tour, uh, you really want to make sure that it's in optimal physical condition before it goes out. But at the same time, if you're, for example, a company that's based in New Jersey and you're doing a corporate in Las Vegas, um, you're sending a truckload of equipment right across the country, and that's a lot of bouncing around. So even for a corporate one-off. Uh, making sure that all the screws are tight in the equipment is a very, very good first step before you put anything in the rack. Um, same thing, uh, missing broken jack hardware. Uh, for example, an XLR, female XLR that doesn't have the release pin on it. I think we've all been in the situation where there's been that one XLR that you can't unplug because the release pin is missing. So you want to check for that kind of thing. Uh, the on quarter inch jacks, maybe the nuts falling off, uh, display backlights that don't light up. Those can be uh, minor, but very irritating uh, problems with equipment. And if you're in the shop and there's an opportunity, to, for example, to send something over to the tech shop and say, hey, can you fix this backlight? Or alternately swap in another unit. Uh, that's the, when you're packing the show in the shop, that's the time to do it. Sorry about that. Uh, the same thing applies to the IP switches. Uh, they are still rack mount equipment. Um, as we all know, the IP world is not really the rock and roll world or the, the touring world, and the, they're starting to come together. But uh, equipment like network switches and so on and so forth is not necessarily built to the same uh, rugged standard that uh, say a rock and roll power amp is built to. So, uh, and considering that the switches are probably one of the most important pieces of equipment out there these days, you really wanna give them a good physical once over as well and make sure that, you know, they're not gonna break off their rack ears and, you know, you're gonna find them hanging in the rack when it gets to Las Vegas. So moving on. Racks, again, plan it out. Uh, the next slide has some drawings and so on, but uh, I will show that. But uh, talk to the engineers that you're working with to find out their preferred operating levels for in-ears and uh, for the receivers and so on. Some receivers come out of the box with uh, something other than zero as the output level. Uh, I've never really understood why. Um, but to figure out where they want to see those levels uh, when you turn it on, it's important information to get and then to get to set those devices all to those levels. The same thing with in-ears. Um, they typically don't want to see uh, an input level of zero. They are want to see 
depending on the device, anywhere from minus eight to minus 21, um, that kind of thing. And you want to know what your monitor engineer's preferred level for driving audio to the in-ears is, uh, particularly since uh, the in-ears is the one thing that you can be guaranteed that there will be uh, an analog audio input going to it. So when you're laying out the rack, um, you want to place units that you need to see and touch near the top of the rack for easy viewing and easy access. And uh, for example, uh, I tend to put uh, receivers higher up in the rack than uh, in-ear transmitters. And the reason is, is that um, once, once a show is going, about the only piece of really useful information that's on the front of an in-ear transmitter is the input level LED, which uh, assuming the system is set up properly is essentially duplicated on the monitor console. And uh, also as an RF technician, there's not an awful lot that I'm going to be doing with that information, except if it's overloading and it's possibly uh, going to affect the RF performance. But other than that, I'm not super interested in the levels that are going to the in-ears. So those can easily sit in the bottom of the rack um, and out of the way. Now, on the other hand, with receivers, uh, where you have the uh, antenna A and antenna B uh, RF displays, and now with the new digital units, you also have the uh, quality of service uh, LEDs or ladder display or LCD display or however they're doing it. Um, that's information that you need to see. You know, is it switching back and forth between A and B a lot? Is it, uh, you know, got full full bars on A and B? Uh, what kind of audio output is coming from the the transmitter? That's the kind of information that you uh, typically will need to keep an eye on during the show. So. That's a good reason to have, uh, again, receivers higher up in the rack so they're closer to eye level. Uh, my standard is I start with antenna distros at the top, then the receivers, and then the in-ear transmitters. Um, power management. The Because there is such a wide variety of different uh, power distribution systems. Different companies have different standards. They have different equipment. They have different uh, UPS systems. They have different uh, main AC connector systems and so on and so forth. It's it's a bit difficult to, um, uh, to put anything specific down here. But what I will say is that when you're building an RF rack, um, the accessibility of the power connections is important in case you have to swap out a piece of equipment. Um, the uh, having it make sense. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Sure system with the uh, the loop through connectors on them uh, with the short cables that they come with. Uh, but um, I never ever. Uh, come up to a rack with that sure equipment in it without reaching in and immediately starting to reseat all those connectors because I do find they get a bit loose. Um, other systems don't have that. Uh, I would say that one of the best things that you could find, I just did some installs and some uh, fixed installation racks last week and uh, having power strips that have a an outlet Basically, every rack space going up the side, the inside of the rack is a pretty cool idea. Um, I can also tell you that I have had racks that I haven't put together where the AC has been um, just an absolute nightmare and uh, to the point where there's stuff in the rack that you literally cannot reach. And uh, to do something about it is like a major teardown. So um, keeping track of where and how you run the AC and doing it in a logical manner, uh, do not under any circumstances ever augment whatever AC is in the rack with a cheap, uh, a cheap you know, Walmart power bar. 
you got to come up with better solutions than that. Um, just um, one thing, um, this I haven't run into this in North America, but I have run into it in Europe. I had a situation where I had eight PSM 1000s and a couple of 821 combiners that were plugged into a 10 amp circuit, um, 10 amp 220 volt circuit, but nonetheless, uh, powering up the rack was enough to trip that 10 amp breaker. So uh, it, it seems incredible that RF gear could actually trip uh, a breaker from inrush current, but um, sometimes it can happen. So you need to also sort of be conscious of how many units you're putting on any given circuit uh, and uh, that kind of thing. Rack planning. Um, I am a, kind of an old school guy. I still use Excel for most of my drawing. Uh, this is a, a, a Excel drawing that I've had around for years, since the early 2000s probably. Um, there you can just go in and do a quick, quick layout of the rack. And uh, first of all, which is really good for you know, figuring out if you've got 13U of equipment, it's not going in a 12 space rack. Uh, so just for determining the size of the rack that you need. Uh, and then again, also just laying it out so you have some physical representation. And if you're not the one that's actually physically putting the rack together, maybe you're handing it off to some junior shop tech or something like that, then you can give them this drawing and say, this is how I want it. The other uh, drawing, the one in blue, as I just whipped this up the other day, and it was just out of sort of out of curiosity, was to see what the maximum number of connections that um, you might actually uh, have on any particular unit, and in this case, in one rack space. Uh, so, oops, just back up for a second. Oh, oh there we go. Um, unfortunately, I can't see the bottom of this drawing on my screen right now, but uh, what it is, what we're looking at basically is we look at the first column, and that is the, if you put a connector into every single connector on that unit, how many connections would there be? And I believe that that one works out to like 18 or 22 or something like that. So given the idea that you can have you know, up to 22 connections of various types of connector in one rack space, and then repeat it in the very next rack space down, the very next rack space down, gives you an idea of um, how much cable management you're gonna have to do in the back of the rack, and just kind of the, the density of cabling that's in there. Uh, I've had some RF racks that have been again, just extremely challenging to get into the back of and uh, you know make any adjustments because of the fact that there's just so much cable back there. So rack prep. On very large racks or on large shows, um, I like to use a master antenna distro, even if the receivers have loop through BNCs. I like to have that master distro to be the first point where my antennas hit very often these days uh, because, uh, I mean, I virtually haven't done an event that wasn't multiple zones of antennas in probably, I would say, it, at least the last four years. Um, so typically that first antenna distro is going to be a multi-zone antenna distro uh, either like the units that are made by professional wireless systems or uh, the WYSICOM MAT-288 is one I use quite a bit, uh, that kind of thing. So that's a good thing to have as your first point of contact for your antenna system. And then it, it gives you some options on how you're going to feed the rest of the, the systems. Um, something that's kind of going away now because uh, most systems are now 
the newest systems anyway are now able to tune over the entire uh, 470 to 616 range that we have available to us is it's not as common to have different uh, band splits of units like it was with say U sure UHFR where you might have some G1s and some H4s, some J5s and so on and so forth. Um, when that was more common, uh, it, I would typically feed the G1s from one set of outputs from the master distro, uh, the J5s from another set, that kind of thing, just to try and uh, keep things organized. Uh, it keeps the noise floor down to not keep daisy chaining receivers uh, over and over, that kind of thing. So that's something to keep in mind is, uh, again, a master antenna distro and then uh, possibly a secondary one. It can be the same unit or uh, a basic two in, eight out kind of distribu distribution. Um, so yes, feed groups of receivers from separate outputs of the master distro. We've just covered that. Um, do not bundle the BNC cables with cable ties. Why? Because um, we'll get into this a bit later when we get into cable, but um, RF cable is round and it's round for a reason. And one of the reasons that it's round is to keep the inner conductor and the shield exactly the same distance apart. And when you use cable ties, what you end up doing is you end up crushing the cable and that changes that distance. Now, uh, if anybody has any sort of electronic background, you'll know that the definition of a capacitor is two conductors separated by a dielectric. Well, an RF cable is basically two conductors separated by a dielectric. So it's like a big long capacitor. And the difference, the distance between the inner conductor and the shield determines the capacitance. So if the cable gets crushed, that distance changes, the capacitance changes, and that causes a uh, a difference in the cable which causes or can cause a reflection in the cable and that um, will typically cost you a little bit of gain. It's generally not a huge amount but you use another cable tie further down, you use another cable tie further down and it all kinds of adds up. The uh, I like to say you know the needles pointing one way or the other. It's either pointing toward uh, not losing gain or losing gain, uh, not losing efficiency or losing efficiency. So um, using cable ties on uh, BNC cable, uh, RF cable is a, is a bad idea, uh, particularly inside of racks. The other thing is, is that when they're tightly bundled together, because they're not 100% shielded, they can both leak RF out of the cable and also leak RF into the cable. So it becomes kind of a, a mix and matchy kind of area for leakage to happen. So uh, I recommend just using like uh, twist ties from um, like bread bags kind of thing and uh, don't bundle them up too much. The other thing that drives me crazy is I know people are, uh, there's people that are considered to be artists putting racks together and everything, and there's not a cable out of place and so on and so forth. And that's absolutely fantastic until you, for example, have to change a port on an antenna combiner because one's not working or because it would be better from a frequency perspective to have this, this transmitter coming out of that port or that sort of thing. And everything is so tightly screwed down inside the rack that you can't move. So I prefer it to be a little looser in the back. Um, what I tend to do is to route the audio connections up the one side, which is typically the right-hand side when you're looking at it from the back of the rack, because that's typically where the, the audio connections are. And the AC and Ethernet connections 
up the left hand side which is also typically where the ac connections are and where the network connections are, are typically on the left when you look at the back of the unit um and those can be you know those can be more tightly strapped down they can be bundled a bit more um but just route them separately from the bnc cable also um Network cables, particularly USB cables, can have a certain amount of RF uh, hash on them. So you want to kind of be, keep them away from the uh, RF cables as well. Yes, Pete? Uh, we do have a question. Do you have an example picture of the rack wired up the way you like it? Um, no. I'll try and see if I have one in my file somewhere, but I, I don't at the moment. Okay. I, I and secondly, secondly, in your rack drawing with a 3RU door panel, wouldn't it be better just to leave it open for heat venting and access to troubleshooting? I know from my standpoint, I hate having any panels on the back of the rack. Um, it could it could very well be. Uh, I mean, there are vented doors. Um, yeah. Yes, probably. Uh, it really depends. Um, I had one rack that had so much cable in it, partly because there were 24 in-ear systems that uh, at least 16 of them were split three ways to combiners. There was so much cable in the back of that rack that if there wasn't doors in there, it would have just puked cable off all over the stage every time you uh, moved it. So would you, um, would you recommend using a, lar a larger rack, uh, more space? I mean, it's not like the truck cares if the track's too big. Um, yes, but in this instance, that particular rack was, I think, like a 22 space double wide, and it Already was jammed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, but um, I will try and come up with a, a an illustration or something for that. Uh, I will just put that on the back burner for now. Uh, any more questions? No, that's enough for now, right? Okay. Um, Another thing is to uh, check BNC cables for defects uh, when you're putting them in. Uh, one of the things I see really, really, really commonly is that they will, one of the pins, one or both of the pins will be recessed slightly. They bump into something and it pushes them back up the cable a little bit. And um, if they're recessed, they're not making full contact. Um, one of the things with, uh, for example, uh, audio connections, like an XLR or whatever, if you have an XLR that's had a rough life and maybe the inner shell is cracked a little bit and one of the pins moves back and it isn't making contact when you plug it in, uh, you will hear that. If you have an RF connection that the pin is maybe not making perfect contact or it's back a little bit, um, it may still work because RF is designed to go through the air. And so um, it's a really good idea, and it's not just RF connectors. I recommend looking in the end of any connector um, before you plug it in. You never know what you'll find in there. Years ago, I was the uh, night maintenance person at a very large recording studio in Toronto, and I um, was asked to go and look in this one room where uh, one channel on one of the tape machines would invert phase in certain, uh, I think when you put it into record in the sync mode or something like that. And I spent hours going over that and looking for what the issue was and I couldn't find it and couldn't find it. And finally I was about to give up and I was plugging the connectors back in and I grabbed a male XLR that was part of the harness for that particular channel and I, was about to plug it in, and as I did, I looked in the end of the XLR, the outside end, not the solder, not the part where the solder goes, but the other end, and there was a splash of solder inside there that was joining pins one and three together. And if I hadn't looked in the end of that connector, I would never have seen that. So uh, just looking in connectors, uh, is a great idea. If you're looking in multi pins, you see a bent pin before you try and mate it. Uh, you're looking in AC connectors, you see bent pins, you see missing screws. Uh, it's just a good idea to look in the connector before you plug it in. 
Yes. Do you do you ever build custom cables for the back of a rack, or do you uh, try to use what's on the shelf? I haven't done that. Um, it would really depend. Uh, first of all, I would say that I don't know, maybe eighty percent of the shops out there do not have infrastructure to build RF cables normally in in there. Uh, very often. Uh, I'm dealing with what what is available, and typically uh, we're going to get into cable a bit more in a minute. But um, typically, uh, the connection cables are the you know the three foot RG58 cables that come with the equipment or are, come from the manufacturer. Uh, hopefully, uh, one thing I'll say this now, and I'll say it about 47 times before the end of this is: do not buy cheap cable off Amazon or anything else. If you're buying things like uh, RG58 cables, please buy them from the manufacturers, buy them from Sure, buy them from Sennheiser, buy them from Electrosonic. Do not buy the 20 cables for 20 bucks off Amazon because 100% it's gonna be crap and you're gonna regret it and it's just gonna bring the whole industry down. So don't buy that stuff. It, um, it one yeah. more question about cabling. Uh, if you have a cable that's too long for a rack, how how should you take up the excess space? Is it okay to take a coax cable and coil it up and tape it in a in a coil? It should it should only be coiled. It shouldn't be figurated or or you know arm wrapped or anything tight or anything like that. Um, there is more stuff about cable coming up, so let's just press on for now. Um, use minimal pass-throughs for antenna connections. So here's the thing about pass-throughs. Every time you go through one, it costs you a dB or so. Um, but on the other hand, I do recommend that you use them because um, people step on RF cables. Uh, you know, if whoever's hooking them up isn't too careful about strain relieving them and all that stuff, um, and they can do a fair bit of damage because of the particular, if they're, well, it doesn't matter if they're BNC or N, either way, they're pretty tightly uh, mated to the mating connector. And if someone steps on the cable or something like that, they can do a fair bit of damage to whatever they're plugged into. So if they're plugged into, for example, your antenna distribution box and you damage the BNC input on that because somebody tripped over a cable, uh, that's a serious issue. If you're using pass-throughs, uh, the worst thing that can happen is the pass-through gets damaged and you either have to replace it or open up the rack and put a barrel in place and just go in that way. So I do recommend that you remote your connections from the actual devices. Uh, also, so you're not like fishing around in the back of the rack every day trying to make these connections, but also just to protect those connectors on the devices so that they don't get damaged in the cases somebody tripping over a cable. Because particularly when you get into the actual show cable, which is, you know, flexible LMR 400 or RG8 or something like that, um, that stuff is pretty strong and again it can exert a fair amount of force on whatever connector it's plugged into so do use pass-throughs but keep spares because they do get broken when you're putting the hardware in the rack um, again this is something that's starting to go away because um, again for example axiant digital or digital 6000 or whatever uh, both of those receivers basically cover the entire range of what we're allowed to work in now. So, but uh, my standard is to put the hardware with the lowest frequency range in the top of the rack, next lowest in the next group. So uh, back to Sure UHFR for a second. So that would be G1s in the first positions, uh, H4s in the next position, J5 in the next position, and so on. Um, there is a drawing that illustrates why I like to do that coming up, so we'll touch on that again in a minute. Um, In-ears, cable the outputs vertically. So on a Sure 821B, for example, the first four inputs would be uh, in-ears one, three, five, and seven, 
which are the ones when you say you're in the back of the rack cabling it, they're on your right. And, uh, and the second four would be two, four, six, and eight. Now, um, I meant to look up a drawing of the back of an 821, which I forgot to do, but I believe that they are numbered one through eight from one side to the other. So um, the point is, is not being sort of slavish to the idea of having in-ear output one go to, to um, combiner input one, output two to combiner input two and so on and so forth. Um, the reason for doing it the way I suggest here is two. First of all, uh, what it does is it, it makes for shorter and more direct cable runs because you're not uh, going across the back of the unit to get, uh, for example, channel two next to channel one on the combiner. Um, and secondly, from a frequency coordination standpoint, um, the way I allocate frequencies and, and also, I mean, the way that uh, I believe that, the, for example, the way Workbench deploys them is they're deployed in uh, order from lowest to highest. So if you have um, uh, channel one output going into combiner one input and channel two output going into combiner two input, then you've got two frequencies that are probably fairly close together. I can assure you if I'm coordinating it, they're quite close together, uh, that are probably fairly close together uh, going into adjacent inputs on the combiner, which is uh, a situation that will can generate more intermod in the combiner than if those frequencies are further apart. So by skipping every other frequency when you're going into the inputs on the combiner, you end up uh, helping to avoid that situation. Um, and another one, and this one is really, really, really critical. It's never, ever, ever daisy chain in-ear combiners. Uh, if, you, if they have to be combined, you use passive combiners. Uh, for example, again on the Shure, the 821B and even the 421B has a passive combiner on the front of each unit. And what those, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can see me as well as the, uh, as the PowerPoint. So what those are, are little two into one passive combiners like this one by mini circuits or this one by professional wireless systems. And um, you need to combine in-ear combiners passively because uh, if you take the output of combiner A and put it into one port on combiner B and, and uh, daisy chain them or cascade them, um, the, uh, the ports are not designed to have multiple frequencies come in. They're designed to have one frequency. And if you put multiple frequencies in them, you're turning that system into a massive intermod generator. And uh, you're not going to be happy with the results and you're not going to be happy with your noise floor. So don't ever do that. And just um, a note on the uh, the combiners that are the, the passive combiners that are on the front of the Shure units, those are um, a separate device from the rest of the combiner. Um, they are on the same circuit board, but they have zero electrical connections to the actual rest of the system. And uh, so, for example, you can use them for anything. I've actually, uh, on the show I did late last fall, I actually was short uh, a combiner for some microphone systems, and I actually combined some receive antennas on uh, one of the um, unused combiner on the front of Assure 821. So it is a completely separate passive combiner that's in there uh, if you need to use it. So. More on RF cabling. This uh, particular screenshot here is from my TTI, and it's actually from something that Pete identified a few years ago, and that is that the um, engines, the racks for various digital consoles, have a fairly can have a fairly significant RF output. In this instance, 
this is a measurement that I took at the front of a of an avid stage rack, um, and it's uh, basically about 196.6 um, megahertz, which is uh, right square in the middle of the upper VHF range. And so, for example, if you are using uh, say you had a rack full of Axion Digital in the V50 range, or I believe ULXD has a has a VHF range, uh, or if you're using uh, RAD intercoms, um, that was that would be actual interference. And minus 82 is a pretty serious. Uh, that's a, that's a serious enough transmit. So. What we, most of us have been using is RG58 for interior rack wiring. And that cable is single shielded, uh, offers at best 95% shielding. So if you are in a position uh, where, for example, you're a technical manager for a sound company or you own the sound company or that kind of thing, and you're in the position to uh, make some adjustments, uh, I consider uh, upgrading your rack wiring to double shielded uh, RG8X or equivalent cable. Um, you have to specify the double shielding. There is RG8X that's not double shielded, um, but if you move to uh, a double shielded system, the shielding is closer to 100%. And again, uh, it's not going to be a showstopper to use the RG58, but you know, as I say, the needle is always pointing one way or the other. And uh, with RG58, it's pointing kind of toward, you know, a higher noise floor. And with a double shielded cable, it's pointing toward a lower noise floor. And um, I, uh, the last tour that I did, actually, I was in a double wide rack and I had my RF equipment on one side and the other side was the Digico engines. So it's not uncommon for RF gear to be uh, pretty close to these uh, RF generators. So um, again, using uh, good quality cable, first of all, and secondly, uh, double shielded if and when you can get your hands on it is, uh, is recommended. So here back to, um, this is actually that rack. You can't see the Digico engines. They're just to the left off the uh, off off to the side of the picture. But um, I just made this slide to give you an illustration of how I um, allocate frequencies and to see that um, in IAS, which is the frequency coordination program that I use almost exclusively. Um, you can see that it allocates frequencies from lowest to highest. And in every, every case, if I can find a way to make um, life easier by being able to see things in the same way in different places, I'm going to do it. So I always allocate frequencies the way they are um, they are allocated by the program. So I will program those into the devices in the same order that you see them on the list. So if somebody comes running up to me and says, hey, Jenna's having a problem with her in-ear, I can go, right, that's 482.950. And uh, I don't have to scan through the whole sheet because I know where her channel is in the rack and that matches up with where it is on the paper. So uh, I highly recommend uh, organizing things in your life that way. Um, yes, Pete. Uh, John Christie wants to know, what do you think was the cause of that VHF carrier from the console stage rack, which uh, Henry notes that was on a show that we were both on in 2016? Uh, that, well, that, that actual picture was one that I took, but uh, so that was on a show that I was on. It was around the same time that you published that post, so I got curious right. about it. And I checked other devices. I had another image that I didn't put up, which was from a Calrec Hydra, and it was doing that as well. Um, and uh, 
anybody that's done broadcast shows knows that those hydras can show up and get plunked down on top of just about anything because that's what the trucks use for their remote uh, I.O. inside the building. So um, uh, this is entirely a guess. It's kind of above my electronics pay grade, but I think it might have something to do with the sampling rate inside the boxes. Mm -hmm. um, there is a whole school of, uh, of study and of um, investigation that has to do with these um, uh, RF noises and so on in electronics. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly as we get into higher and higher and higher speeds, uh, there's some stuff we're that I will get into when we get further into the cable thing that will uh, sort of call back to that. But um, there's basically, it's kind of like the angry buzzing of bees because there's so much happening in there so quickly. So back, back to your note about using RG8 in double shielded in your rack, yeah. Kevin Parrish notes they're converting to RG223 for all rack jumpers. Uh -huh. uh, just because it's better shielded already. Um, yes, that, that's a great idea. I had a, a long talk with Henry about this the other day when I was preparing this, and uh, he spewed out a bunch of numbers. Uh, of, of There is a bunch of different cables that um, basically what you're looking for is diameter and flexibility. Uh, you can't wire a rack with LMR 400. It's just not going to fit. So you need to find a cable that has uh, excellent shielding uh, and excellent flexibility and, uh, a, you know, the smallest practical diameter because you could end up with a lot of cable in the back of the rack. But I highly recommend that everybody moving forward really start to look for a better grade of rack patching cables. I mean, is it going to kill us to keep using RG58? Well, we've survived this far. Um, you know, I mean, don't go home and slash your wrist because you only have RG58 in your shop. But if there's an opportunity, if there's a capital purchase coming up, if there's a chance to present and say, you buy know, something better. yeah, buy something better. That's, yeah, yeah. that's how it is. That's uh, kind of what I was talking about at the beginning about best practices versus what you can actually do. Right. Neil White uh, from England does, says, uh, do you typically use 50 ohm terminations on unused DA outputs and or combiner inputs, or do you not bother with it? I'm kind of a mixture of both. I've never had enough 50 ohm terminators to do everything I'd like to. Uh, once again, it is absolutely best practice to do it. And once again, is it going to kill you if you don't? Probably not. Um, all of these things, again, it comes down to the needle pointing one way or another. And sometimes where the needle is pointing um, is influenced by the environment. And if you are 99% of the time, you're in fairly okay RF environments and you have fairly okay stuff and you're, you know, and, and it all works, that's great. And the 1% of the time that you get into a really tough RF environment, um, maybe having more of unused connections terminated, maybe having better RF cable, maybe uh, that kind of thing is going to be the thing that helps you get through that tougher show. It's just, it's it's one of those things that's very, very difficult to name a situation where, you know, this show crashed and burned because there wasn't Terminators on these right, particular right. inputs. But, right. But uh, Jason yeah. Glass says, for what it's worth, he finds LMR-195, which is actually pretty small, ideal for internal rack jumpers uh, and he's seen racks of 24 IEM mixes rendered worthless by audible heterodyne whistling because of RGA 58 leakage. Well for what it's worth that is worth a lot because I value Jason's opinion extremely and uh, so that's a good thing. So 
uh, make a note of that number. What was it? LMR195, did you say? Correct. Yeah. Good to know. That's one of the ones that Henry mentioned to me the other day. Uh, moving on. Documentation. This is a screenshot of a spreadsheet that I've been using in one form or another for a number of years. And in it, I keep track of everything that I think is important to know about, uh, excuse me, an RF system. Uh, in this case, uh, receivers and their res respective transmitters. So uh, you could see the, the name of the unit, Who's it? Who it's assigned to? What model it is? The firmware, the uh, gain setting, the power setting, the range that it's in, the high pass filter setting, what capsule is on it. Uh, at one point, we changed the gain, and I made a note of that, and the IP address of the receiver. Um, so this is the kind of information that, again, if your rack goes off a loading dock if the truck gets hijacked, if something happens and you have to cross rent equipment in a hurry, having this information in front of you is gonna make the difference between, you know, somehow, you know, uh, stumbling your way through it and actually having the show come off the way it's supposed to, which the show is supposed to come off the same way every night in every venue, for whatever, you know, without fail. So having this information at your ha at hand is, um, I think, absolutely critical to, um, you know, maintaining, uh, maintaining consistency and again, being able to, uh, to respond to a kind of extreme emergency uh, or even again, if somebody says, hey, you know, if, if the manager calls up and says, hey, you know, uh, the artist is doing a, like an appearance at a record store, if, those are, if that's still a thing, uh, you know, is doing an appearance at a record store downtown and um, they just need to know, you know, how to set up his microphone so he, he likes it. And you can go, okay, you know, put 12 dB of gain on it, put 100 hertz high pass on it and uh, you're good to go. Just having that kind of information is absolutely, I think, essential. I don't think there's any uh, reason not to keep it, and I don't think there's any excuse for not keeping track of that thing. Uh, again, it's Excel. You can come up with your own columns. You can add columns. You can change columns. You can do whatever you want, but it's a, it's a, a guideline to, again, keeping track of the information that makes the difference between the show being the show and uh, a bunch of equipment. Here's another, uh, if you look at the, the tab at the bottom, and this is the same document, uh, that page that we were looking at, it's from a different show, but it's the same document. And you can look at the tabs at the bottom. The first one says Mike's the second one says IEMs, and the third one says antennas. And I call this page the antenna map. And what I do is I keep track of um, the different zones, what the antenna is used for, what type of antenna it is, where it's physically located, um, and typically also how it's mounted, um, the cable run and type, Sometimes I'll enter cable loss in there, sometimes not. Um, and the next two columns are uh, dedicated. This particular show had uh, WYSICOM BFA filters on every input. And uh, so those filters are showing the, the range. They were set on the 40 megahertz uh, narrow band uh, adjustable range, uh, which is a great thing to have and uh, how much uh, gain was built into them on, on the front end. So again, this is, this is the kind of thing where, particularly when you're doing, um, unlike touring, this was from an, a, a, a corporate uh, fashion show actually, where you're in the venue for a week and someone says, Hey, uh, what's happening with antenna A over in stage left? And you go, maybe you don't remember 
like what you did because you put it in on Tuesday and it's Saturday. So uh, having this kind of uh, information where you can just keep track of that is really good for uh, when a situation, for example, again, when something starts to go wrong and you go, well, you know, no, we should be getting better reception on stage left. And, you know, maybe somebody's run over the cable with a forklift or something like that, or, or a coupler's pulled out or something like that. So again, that's, uh, that's good information to, uh, to keep track of. Further documentation. So when you're in the shop and you've, uh, got everything in the rack and everything hooked up and you've done all the networking which is a hugely time consuming thing these days um, i'm actually of the opinion that uh minute for minute second for second all of the time that we used to spend troubleshooting buzzes and hums and ground loops has been directly replaced by tracking down ip connection problems um, Anyway, so you have your show file. So you want to make, uh, for me anyway, I'm virtually always going to have a coordination by the time I'm in the shop. Um, secondly, once you have the equipment and you're physically hooked up to it, you can create a workbench file. You can create a WSM file. If you're using Electro, you can use a wireless systems designer file. Um, all of those things are good to have. Any IP related files uh, like the Dante routing, if you're using Dante, um, which reminds me, I have a question for uh, Kelly in a second, but uh, if you're using Dante, um, that the uh, that you can save those things, Dante, uh, I forget what the Dante systems manager or something, um, save them all on a clean usb stick that clean is particularly for the younger members of the shop crew that maybe aren't as uh meticulous about making sure that their computers don't have viruses and stuff like that make sure your computers don't have viruses um don't put them on a piece of documentation that you're going to be sending to a show i've seen what happens when a uh uh, an avid engine shows up on a show with a virus in it and it's not pretty um, and then once you've saved them on a usb stick or or sticks uh, then upload them to the cloud like dropbox onedrive whatever all of them whatever you need to do to make sure that there are other ways of accessing it besides actually physically hooking up to the equipment because again if something happens to the equipment and you have to get this stuff working in a hurry. To be able to hook up a computer to a rack full of uh, Sure equipment, for example, and go, here's your w here's your workbench file, boom, programmed, uh, is uh, much better than sitting there and typing it all in bit by bit by bit by bit. Um, my question for Kelly Epperson is, um, on larger shows, where uh, perhaps someone else is dealing with the IP, uh, the the doling out of IP addresses, particularly for example when you're taking Dante out of wireless devices. Um, what is the protocol for assigning IP addresses? Oh, that's a great question. Um, we could debate that one till um, well next session begins, but. Um, uh, I, a lot of times that'll come down to uh, the vendor, frankly, is, is most of the time. In my case, I defer to where that def that um, that vendor uh, likes to operate. Um, now, obviously, if you're using something like WaveTool, you're going static IP. Um, so you have no choice but to be in that functionality. Um, uh, in other I times, static IPs anyway. So, but, right. but the so, question is, I'm usually assigning my own IP addresses for the RF stuff. But my question is, is yeah. when that crosses over into the Dante world? Yeah, no, that that now that to your point specifically there. Um, in my case, I always identify a gatekeeper, especially on a larger show. Who is that that network manager? Usually, it, they're they're in the system tech role in some form or fashion. Um, mm -hmm. 
but uh, we don't we don't want multiple people making uh, multiple routes. Uh, we also don't want to have. Um, I've, I've done it two ways um, on shows where we have multiple networks. Um, I don't have a problem having multiple networks and multiple um, lands, if you will. I don't have a problem with multiple fibers running around. I don't feel like everything has to go through a single VLAN uh, switch, or uh, not single VLAN, but uh, I'll be on a single um, uh, pair of fibers and all those kind of things. So a lot of times, if it's possible, I'll say, hey, take this network management over here. This is yours, right? But yeah. then the Dante, like in the case of Axiant Digital, uh, being able to um, uh, set that receiver up to be on a separate control network from a Dante network. And those might be two people, but usually they're they're the same person that mm -hmm. um, we, we try to funnel and manage through. Um, because again, bigger ramifications later, especially if you're in Dante controller, um, the, the challenge of, hey, you just changed my route, right? That's always, yeah. now does that happen? Very rarely, right? Um, but um, the I do like the idea of the RF manager having control of their network though, right? Yeah. Because a lot of times you need to be doing something or Pete needs to be doing something while we're, we're over here managing audio as well. And so the idea of, um, you know, until that day comes when we have our network audio administrator um, on the show, and I'm hoping that role shows up sooner than later, um, we're always going to have to live in that back and forth. Did I, did I answer that enough? I think so. I mean, I, uh, to be honest, I'm not even 100% sure if you can have uh, separate IP addresses and Dante addresses. For example, I think in Axiom Digital you can if you if you split the four. Correct. Yeah, control network. Yeah, you do. Yeah, have a Dante yeah. address. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but uh, other Jason, units, I'm not sure about. Yeah. Jason says it points out that 192.168 are public, and 10.10 .10 is explicitly private. It's one way to start with. If any part of your show is being is going outside the the immediate area to let's say the produ production side of things, yeah. give them 192.168 and keep your 10.10 .10 for your equipment internally i know that claire 192 is still a private address yeah, it's, it's still but, but the two different you're talking about right. using two different ranges absolutely right but for instance claire when they buy a new piece of equipment when they log it into their uh, inventory they assign a 10.10 .10 address to it so every piece of equipment that they own already has a has a unique address assigned to it so hmm. they're a particularly organized rental company. So in that case, though, if I was in their shop building a rack, I mean, I wouldn't be assigning the 10.10. .10, uh, it's all labeled on the back of the well, equipment. I would just be making a note of it and, and building my files accordingly, I guess. Correct. Yeah. Huh, wow, Correct. Yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, okay, well, that was uh, just had that question myself. Uh, shall we press on? Absolutely. Yep. Okay, looks like we're sort of right on doing oh, okay for time. Back to, your, yeah. back to your records when you're talking here. Yeah. Uh, very important to remember in this COVID-19 world, Kevin points out, the new normal, uh, if somebody in crew got sick, it's imperative to maintain the system records so that other people can find the information. Absolutely. So absolutely. Keeping, right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Moving on. Shop prep for RF antennas. So you want to check every antenna over for uh, good physical condition, especially uh, BNC or the end connectors and the mounting hardware. Those are kind of the two things on them that can break. Uh, anything else on an antenna that, that breaks, it's going to be pretty obvious because it's going to be like a, a broken piece of circuit board or something like that. But um, I had a, a a uh, colleague uh, who was out on a little tour write to me and go, oh, we're really having some problems with our in-ears and, you know, not sure if it's a frequency thing or what. And anyway, one thing or after one thing led to another and I said, well, you know, try it with like a, just a whip antenna. And they went, oh, that's better. And I said, well, 
look at your antennas. And she sent me a picture of, she had two uh, Sennheiser 2003 antennas and both of them, the uh, BNC connector was broken. The uh, inner insulator was basically missing and uh, the pin was just kind of hanging there. And it's like, well, you got broken antennas. That's the problem. So check them over because uh, nobody needs to be opening a road case on a show and taking a broken antenna out. So that's what the uh, shop prep is all about. Um, if you have an antenna tester, such as the, oh, let's just not whack the mic too many times, uh, such as the Rig Expert AA1000, um, you can uh, test the antennas and establish a base VSWR reading. Uh, this is going to be embarrassing because many of you know more about this than I do, but I just put this in the presentation. Uh, this word stands for voltage standing wave ratio and is also referred to as SWR, standing wave ratio. It's a function of the reflection coefficient, which describes the power reflected from the antenna. So let's talk about waves for a minute. Long time ago, a, a colleague of mine since passed away, he was a sailor, he had a sailboat, he sailed on Lake Erie. And one time he said to me, he said, if you're ever out on Lake Erie and you get into a storm, he said, you gotta figure out whether to run for the American side or run for the Canadian side. He said, run for the American side. And I went, sure, cheap smokes, weak beer, you know, why wouldn't you? He goes, no, that's not why. He said, the harbors on the Canadian side were probably designed by British engineers in the 17, 1800s or whatever, and they have parallel walls. And the harbors on the American side do not have parallel walls. So if you go into one of the Canadian harbors in a storm and the waves are doing a lot of things, you will get standing waves. And I went, wow, we're talking about water waves here. And I know what a standing wave is, and I've, you know, I've known about it in audio since, you know, year two or whatever. And uh, and suddenly you're telling me that an actual wave wave, like a pile of water, could set up a standing wave. And the point of that story is that waves is waves, and they perform uh, in similar ways, but what changes is the frequency um, and um, so for example uh, in the audio domain you can get standing waves in a venue from parallel walls you can get um, cancellations of audio on for example a lectern mic if you've got a reflective surface at the bottom and you've got the direct thing and you know when you get up into the radio domain of radio waves bouncing around, you get uh, reflected waves and direct waves, and you get cancellations from that, and that's what uh, diversity antennas are about. And when you get up into uh, really high frequency stuff, like on circuit boards, for example, you can have waves inside circuit board traces uh, bouncing off each other and canceling and taking longer to get from point A to point B than the other or getting there too quickly and so on and so forth, um, which is what I was referring to earlier in that there's a whole school of electronic design engineering that is just figuring out the various conflicts and issues and so on we can just have with these very, very high frequency signals bouncing around on, in these circuit boards. So moving back down uh, a bit into um, RF cables, for example, what I was referring to earlier when I said about the cable ties uh, compressing the cable and changing the diameter and so on, is you get reflection points where waves will actually reflect back down the cable and they will cancel some of the information that's coming. and an antenna is uh, essentially, uh, how can I put this? Just had a long talk with Henry about this the other day, but it basically an antenna is a transducer um, and it is going to uh, reflect certain waves and it is, uh, and the zone where it is least reflective is where it is most sensitive to new waves coming in. So, um, 
when you're checking a VisWare setting, you're going to see a sort of a V-shaped plot, and the bottom of the V is the uh, this frequency that that antenna is tuned to. So the area of the lowest reflection is the optimal tuning area for the antenna. So frequencies that come in in that area in that in that range are going to get passed down the cable and ones that are above and below that are going to get reflected from the antenna so hopefully that wasn't too confusing and not too far off the mark uh, i'm sure i'll hear from people if it was moving on shop prep for rf antenna support check all mic stands tripod stands magic arms clamps etc for missing and broken parts Again, there's nothing more irritating than opening a case and taking out a stand and going to set up and find out that the thing that locks the three legs in position is not there. Um, so all of that stuff should absolutely be checked to the longest, you know, to the smallest detail before the stuff leaves the shop. Uh, if it can't be used safely, it's useless. Um, have multiple mounting options for each antenna as conditions can change a lot on site as in when the producer says i don't want to see those antennas there and it's like oh okay well i'll have to take them off those tall mic stands and put them on some ma magic arms and clamp them in the truss or something or mount them under the stage or go up into a vom and shoot them across the stage um one thing, since we're looking at a picture of a couple of helical antennas, one thing I have noticed with helicals is uh, there is a point where the um, the coil of copper through the in the tube meets the the brass tuning strip, and there's a nut and bolt that goes through there and joins them together. Um, and particularly when I was on a long stadium tour a couple of summers ago and we got rained on and we had hot weather and damp weather and everything else, um, I noticed that the Visware uh, measurements on those antennas would sometimes creep out a speck and by making sure that that connection between the, uh, the antenna strip and the tuning strip was clean and tight uh, would often correct that. Um, do not reef them to the point where the nut rips the copper foil apart, but uh, it's something to keep an eye on. Common errors. Uh, things that I have seen um, and typically seen on the show. Uh, missed loop-through connections. It's uh, several times I've gotten a rack of uh, receivers that are uh, fed at the top and then loop through and loop through and loop through and then suddenly you get to the middle and there's one missing on say the a side or the b side um, another time i had a rack that uh, all of the loop throughs were there but whoever did it did not understand the fact that the connections were not interchangeable um, in other words that they were directional and um, uh, they were uh, backwards. And I found this out when I powered up the rack and turned on all of them and I saw a signal on the very top unit and none of the rest. Um, cascaded IEM combiners. This picture is taken from a, a gig where I had was not present for the rack build. It showed up uh, on a gig and it was one of those gigs where it was like, well, normally it's a three days to do this show, but we only have the venue for two days, so we're going to do it in two days. Those are terrible. Try not to do those gigs. Anyway, so there wasn't a lot of time. I uh, hadn't seen the rack ahead of time. I did have some back and forth on the phone, but um, one of the things that showed up is what we have is a Sennheiser 3200 combiner, and then there's a, a Sure PA421 underneath it. And uh, when I got the rack, uh, I didn't even turn it on before I spotted this, but uh, one port on the uh, 3200 was coming out and going into one port on the 421. And I go, oh, that's not going to work. So that is my uh, trusty uh, professional wireless two-way combiner um, uh, that uh, I used to uh, resolve that problem. And the other thing 
if you look carefully, you can see that there's a whip antenna and two uh, cables coming out of the uh, the passive combiner on that 421B. The cable on the right is the uh, is the combined output of the two uh, two combiners. The thick cable in the middle is the LMR 400 cable that's going to the helical that's covering the stage. And since this rack was up the VOM and away from the stage, is that whip antenna is like a local transmit for the in-ears. So you could just make sure that uh, the monitor guys could make sure they were doing what they were supposed to. Um, unsupported rack gear. Uh, for example, when you have a, a big, long, deep piece of equipment that is either just not on top of anything or uh, you know it's just hanging in the back well that's that's asking for trouble you need to if you've got long deep equipment you need to either come up with rear supports or you need to rack the stuff in such a way that uh, you know each piece is sitting on the piece underneath it so it's not just hanging there by the front rack screws um, inaccessible rear panels on equipment. I can't remember what piece of equipment it is, but I think there was one antenna distribution, possibly a Sennheiser, that was not very deep, about six, six or eight inches deep. And uh, the receivers that it worked with were uh, a good four inches deeper. And since that unit is only one rack space, if it was in between a bunch of these things, then you had an inch and three quarter space to try and get in there and uh, connect a bunch of uh, BNC connectors, and it was just a nightmare. So again, with something like that, you either have to put it on the top so that it's not covered up on both sides, or uh, you very least need to have a trumpeter uh, tool, which is a uh, tool for um, mounting and unmounting uh, BNCs. And here's a secret tip. If you don't have one, go over and ask the video people. They probably do. Uh, anatomy of an RF cable. So here is an illustration of what a good quality RF cable looks like. As you can see, um, you have the center conductor, then you have the foam dielectric around it. And the uh, the care and attention that goes into uh, creating that foam dielectric to make it as universal, as uniformly round as possible, uh, to keep the distance between the center conductor and then the outer shield, which is you can see the the copper foil shield there, and then just behind the copper foil shield, you can see the actual copper wire braid shield. That is what a double shielded uh, braid over braid over foil, a proper good quality uh, coax cable looks like. And um, again, you can see why uh, compressing them would uh, change those uh, relationships and so on and so forth. So there, at least you've seen what one good quality cable looks like. Shop prep for RF cables. So you want to inspect every cable for nicks, cuts, kinks, bends, and crushing. Um, if you see nicks that are severe enough to expose the braid, for example, I would say you should consider not using them because uh, once things like water and dirt get in there, it's going to affect the performance of the cable. Um, Kinks, bends, crushing, uh, because of the reasons that we've already discussed about uh, changing the, the physical diameter uh, of the cable are all things that can cause uh, the cable to be less efficient than uh, it should be. Uh, inspect connectors for bent or broken rings. That's particularly on BNC connectors. Uh, particularly when you're doing, say, arenas or something with concrete floors, when people unplug cables and they drop to the floor, the end, uh, the round ring on the end of the BNC connector can really take a beating. They can get out of round. They can crack. Um, so again, if you're uh, on a long tour, I suggest having replacement ends in the tooling to, to install them as well. Um, 
bent, crushed, or recessed pins. I've seen all of those. Spread sockets. End connectors uh, have the female have a like a four-piece socket in them. And uh, I've seen that where those four pieces get bent out and they're not making proper contact with, uh, um, with the pin that goes into them. A lot of this is, you can just eyeball it. Um, you can test the cable with a spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator. Uh, using a DC cable tester like you use for mic cables and speaker cables and all that stuff is almost useless for measuring RF performance because you can still get uh, uh, a DC signal from one end of, the, of a cable to another and you might not be getting a lot of RF through it. Um, when you're looming cables, especially new ones, if you take the time, and I mean really, really, really take the time to lay them out on the floor and lay them out absolutely flat, and it means taking like a lot of care to like walk down the cable and see where it might be just kind of be looped over or something, and you just have to, you know, unloop it by half a twist or something to just get it to lay out absolutely flat on the floor before you start to tape them together then um, the looms are going to coil a lot better um, and they will have a longer life than if, for example, one of them wants to coil inward and the other one wants to coil outward, or that's assuming that it's just two cables in the loom. If it's more than that, um, it's going to be even worse. So really take the time to do that. Um, and the last thing is cables are consumable, they, can't, they will wear out, they do wear out, and they will need to be replaced. So if you're going out on a long uh, tour, then you should think about, for example, building that into the budget, or at the very least, um, you know, having the spares in a work trunk, in a cable trunk, before you leave. Uh, that way it's kind of buried in the budget already. Battery chargers, same as other things, inspect for loose rack screws, uh, front panels, broken doors, uh, mess, you know, dirty contacts, uh, all, the, all the physical things that can happen to a piece of rack gear. Look for that. Um, I've noticed that the Shure SBC chargers, the ones that charge the SB9, I think, is the battery that gets used in the in-ear and, and a bunch of other things. Um, that giving the door, the outer door contact a wipe from time to time helps because sometimes if you put them in and it doesn't recognize the battery right away, it's because that back contact's a little dirty. Um, personally, I think networking battery chargers is extremely optional. I don't feel like I necessarily have the time or the mental bandwidth to be looking at that on the network, um, it totally depends on your situation and your preferences. That's just my preference. I'm pretty content to just walk over to the front of the unit and look at it if I have a question about a specific battery or something like that. Um, but the good news is that they do provide diagnostics on batteries and I highly recommend uh, looking at the diagnostics. I have on occasion had some batteries that have given me trouble um, and one of the surest signs that you have a, a defective battery is if the system does not recognize it as what it is. Like instead of saying, oh, this is an SB9 rechargeable, it says, oh, this is an alkaline battery, then um, you can be sure that there's something that's not quite right with that battery. Testing receivers. We're kind of in the home stretch here, folks. So, uh, this is a technique that I, I believe came out of the Claire shop, at least that's where I heard about it, is tune all of the receivers to one frequency. Um, and the reason that asterisk is there is because if you remember back at the beginning about doing the factory reset, if you factory reset them, they actually will be on one frequency, the same frequency already. Um, assuming that you're in an area where, for example, 470, 100, is a legit frequency to use. In other words, it's not in, uh, you know, D channel 14 is not occupied either by DTV or public safety, then you could just leave it there. 
Um, if not, then, you know, tune them all to one legal frequency. And you can create a uh, template in Workbench or WSM or w Wireless Systems Designer or whatever that just says, send the same, send this one frequency to every receiver. Uh, sync and power up a transmitter and check that all units are getting into both the A and B antennas. Uh, look for missing blue lights and the Sure products. So that's a way to find out, it's the way to find that missing loop through cable or um, you know, maybe if it's there, but it's sort of there, maybe that, that particular BNC cable is one with a recessed pin in it or something like that. Um, disconnect one antenna at a time. I think we just covered that. Uh, so you're looking for swapped A and B inputs. Uh, what is really the problem with having swapped A and B inputs? 90% of the time, it doesn't really matter. The receiver's just going to go to the other antenna if it's having a problem. But if you start having real problems and you start needing to troubleshoot something in the field, it's just better that everything is doing the same thing at the same time. So that's a it's a good time to check to make sure that all the A's are A's and all the B's are B's. Um, connect the network and ensure that all units are present and respond to controls. This probably should have been higher up in the list. Missing units that are grayed out could either be duplicate IP addresses or bad RJ45 cables. And there's a lot of bad RJ45 cables out there. There's a lot of them where the little locking tab is broken off. And uh, I've had lots of systems where you turn it on one day and, oh, receiver six is not showing up. And you go in the back and you push the connectors on the back of the switch and you push the connectors on the back of the device and boom, there it is again. It's just an annoying thing. So don't have something leave the shop with bad RJ45 connectors on it. Um, and also it's a good idea when you're bundling the RJ45s just to include some clearly identified spare cables that have enough cable on them to reach to you know any receiver it needs to get to or any device it needs to get to and uh, and the switch and if you're using a wi-fi connection you should check that testing iems you want to connect the transmit antenna turn on one transmitter sync all the packs to that one frequency. Um, now it's assuming that uh, you have just one band like G10 or whatever. If you have more than one, you'll have to do this for each band. Uh, feed program or pink noise into the system and walk test them all. Um, repeat for multiple bands. This will verify that all the receivers are performing as expected and or weed out the ones that aren't. So if some of them are you know, weak when you get to one end of the shop or something, then maybe that, that particular uh, belt pack has a problem. Uh, as soon as you have one belt pack that performs as expected, then you've got a, a, um, a baseline to compare all the other ones. So if, again, if you get one that's weak, then that's a sign that there, there's something wrong with it. Um, program coordinated frequencies into all the transmitters. Verify that all the transmitters are showing up on the correct combiner inputs. Most combiners either have an LED that lights up when their uh, transmit channel is turned on, or in the case of like the uh, professional wireless GX8, it will uh, it will show you the frequency of the channels on. Um, so make sure those are all coming up in the right place. Switch on the transmitters one at a time. Verify the transmit level with a spectrum analyzer if you have one. If you don't have a spectrum analyzer, uh, assuming that you have a receiver that covers some of the same territory as your in-ear transmits, you can use uh, Workbench or WSM or Wireless Systems Designer, etc. You can just use one of those to, um, to uh, verify it. If you see a level that's lower than the others, say you might see them, you know, in the shop in a close environment like that, you might see them show up at say minus 40. If you have one that's say minus 48 or minus 50 or minus 53 or something, that's still plenty to make the pack work. But um, you know, there should be a reason why you're getting less. Now it's possible 
that that particular frequency in that particular space is, uh, you know, has more reflections than other frequencies. And so there's some cancellation there. So uh, try a frequency that worked on another system on that particular system. And if the issue clears up, then you know that it was a, a basically a shop related uh, reflection that was causing it to come back lower. And in which case you're good. Um, if it doesn't clear, try swapping combiner ports and or the cabling to the combiner. Don't swap the port and the cabling at the same time. Uh, that's just bad troubleshooting. And just be aware that port failure is not unheard of in IAM combiners, and sometimes you can have a bad port. Uh, RF spares kit. It's good to have spares, and it's good to pack it at the shop. And so uh, at minimum, I would say uh, B and C or N barrels or both, depending on what, what kind of connector your shop uses. Um, Spare panel pass-throughs, as discussed earlier. Um, attenuators, preferably at least two of each value. And I'll give you an example of attenuators in action. I was doing an outdoor hockey game one time, and uh, one of the uh, opening bands had uh, a Sennheiser Evolution Series guitar rig just sitting out on the stage. And I had allocated a frequency and the backline guy came and said, you know, we're getting a lot of noise on that frequency. I said, I'll get you another frequency. There's 305 frequencies in the coordination. Um, allocate another frequency. I said, oh, I'm having trouble with that. I go out there with the spectrum analyzer in my computer, find another frequency, look at it on the spectrum analyzer. It's clean, put it in the unit. It's going pow, pow, pow. It's just getting hit all over the place. So clearly finding a clear frequency wasn't the really the solution. So uh, I happened to have uh, just on me with, with my spectrum analyzer, I had a, a 3 dB pad and a 6 dB BNC pad, put one of them on the A antenna, the other one on the B antenna, just knocked down the input sensitivity of that system, which you know the guitarist was gonna be like six feet away, um, set it on a frequency and it all worked. It was fine. And a miracle of miracles, I even got my attenuators back after the gig. So that's a good reason to have attenuators there. Filters, always good to have. Also have in pairs because the antennas are going to be A and B pairs. Uh, passive splitter combiners, we've uh, touched on those. Uh, line amplifiers. I Sometimes you actually need gain. I tend to shy away from it as much as possible, but sometimes if you have really long cable runs, you just need to make up that loss. Uh, short BNC cables, again, for, uh, you know, fixing things in the rack or, you know, connecting a filter, for example, to the back of an antenna. Um, adapters from basically anything to anything. Uh, magic stand and magic arm, mic stand and magic arm parts, thread adapters, and again, a trumpeter tool. Shop prep for RF deployment kit. So bread tins for transmitters. Uh, you can use anything from, there is a Weber barbecue, I forget the part number, but it's a grease tray, but it's a it's a basically like a tin foil loaf pan except it's long enough to get like a, a uh, an ad2 transmitter into um label makers with lots of spare tape uh pvc scotch gaff and other tape and probably maybe some scotch real scotch as well uh assortment of medical tapes and band-aids for cable dressing uh particularly with lav mics and so on alcohol prep pads and other disinfectant wipes hand sanitizer dispenser, and a small waste basket. I had my own waste basket on the last tour I was on, and it was the best thing I ever had. And a cherished possession, because when you have all those alcohol prep pads and all those other things, um, you're going to generate a certain amount of, of garbage, and it's always a pain in the ass finding a, a proper garbage bin in a venue. So carry your own. And that is that presentation. Questions, please.
So way back in the beginning, we talked about public and private IP addresses, and uh, there was a, a, a slew of of questions come came through. And uh, Jason had said uh, 192168 public, 1010 are private. He means for him. His 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 method. He does all his private ah. to 1010, and 192168 public, 172 is also another public frequency. So he, he just sets it up for his own method. Um, By public, you mean outside of what he's well, they're controlling. All public. They're all public. Right. They're all available to anybody within your network. Within that's, your, that's yeah, within. Jason's, yes, that's right. Jason's however, designation. However, he's, exactly. he's saying. All his are 1010, and then yeah. the producer, whoever wants an IP, it can get 192.168. Yeah. Or the that's silly. system. The silly yeah. Tom guy probably gets 192.168.42. Anyway. Uh, you'll get um, nothing in my kit, Peter. Nothing, nothing. Um, also, several people said you should all have the proper crimpers and connectors for every single different kind of connector you have on your system, whether it's an end connector that has to be soldered, whether it's to be an RJ45. There's also a whole series of little clip-on plastic adapters for RJ45 connectors that have had their lock ripped off. Uh -huh. There's a little cheap thing that just clips on and puts a new lock on a connector. Very good uh -huh. thing to have a bunch of those in there. Yeah. Sure, um, yeah, now, those thing, are good. Yeah. Um, one thing I would like to point out that Ike brought up that was very important is absolutely having the proper tools, absolutely having extra connectors, and absolutely knowing how to terminate that connector before you learn how to do it yeah. in the field at showtime when yeah. you need that cable, right? right? right. Yeah. Oh, when, when there's somebody um, waiting for that circuit to be made. And, and you should practice 10 times in the shop before you're sure you know how to do it. And end, an end connector, right, right, with the special dies, all those kind of things are gonna require a little different understanding. I mean, even RJ45s. You know. One of the things yeah, I no, absolutely. Somebody, a poorly terminated cable is not a fix. Right. It, it could somebody create more me, problems. Somebody handed me a box of our of, of Cat5 cable and I have to run a bunch of things. I first put pull the end of it out from inside and put a connector on it, and then put a connector on the other end that's sticking out, test that the whole thousand feet. When I know that's working then I know the one that I'm carrying out up to the top of the grid is wired right. Yeah. And I will send that out with a tester on the end of it. And then when I when they have enough, I'll cut it off, put another connector on and test it. Um, and usually never get the other end of the tester back. Um, you don't have as much luck as Ike, I guess. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, Derek Chandler says, Clarify, he, he says, what's your be best practice method for testing antenna cables um so this is uh this this had underwent some discussion uh with the several people because um i i personally own a uh anritsu ms 2721b spectrum analyzer it's a big boy spectrum analyzer new they cost tens of thousands of dollars uh i got one uh, for a very good price used. And the reason I bought it is because it had the tracking generator on it, because I went out and did a show that I built in uh, the Solotech shop in Montreal. I built the show. Uh, it was another outdoor hockey game. I spent too much time figuring out that one of my long antenna cable runs was bad. And I went, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. And so I spent the money and I got uh, an analyzer with a tracking generator. It's a wonderful analyzer. I get a lot of other use out of it, but I got it for the tracking generator yeah. and I use that to test cables. Um, last fall, uh, Ryan Stotts and I did a, a show and uh, we we got to the shop. The show was, uh, we did it with Don Cooser, a, a professional wireless we got to the shop in New Jersey. I got to work on programming and all this stuff. And Ryan got his field fox out, went over to the to the caddy full of cables, took every single one of them out and tested every single one of them with the with the uh, tracking generator. And 
you know, to go and leave the shop and know that you have good cables is, is really important. Um, there is, uh, well, there are cheap ways to do it. For example, um, the RF Explorer system makes a tracking generator. I haven't used it. I actually own the tracking generator without owning the, uh, the analyzer. I sold it. I personally, I don't like that interface at all. And, uh, but for, you know, less than a thousand bucks and some patience, uh, you can have a tracking generator that you can check cables with, uh, with a couple of those boxes. Um, I do not know of another way of verifying them. What I would do is take your mic receiver and put a put a 25 foot antenna cable on it, put an antenna on it, an, an omni antenna, low gain, take a transmitter without the transmitter antenna on it, put it 10 feet away, look at the level on your receiver. Maybe move the transmitter 20 foot, 30 feet until the top LED just goes off. So you just see it on screen. Then replace that 10 foot cable with your 100 foot cable or your 200 foot cable and see how much that changes. If it's if it's a little tiny bit, then the cable's good. If it's a lot, then the cable's bad. It's not a quantitative way of testing it, but it but it at least can verify that you're getting pretty close to what you should be getting through it. That that is that's that's a valid test, but it's also not a swept test, right? So it's only no, the it's one frequency. Yeah, so it's really only yeah. one frequency. Yeah, yeah. But but yeah, I mean, if the cable is a complete piece of crap, it'll tell you that because you oh, know, yeah. like if it's just not working at all. And yeah, I mean, anything is better than nothing, really. Yeah, and I've been on shows. Actually, give you the frequency response of the cable. I've been on shows where the two foot jumper in the rack was the bad cable, right? Not the long cable. So you and and it tested fine in the shop because I was close to the rack. Yep. If yeah, I just I had a, taken my my wireless mic and walked across the street, I would have seen that it didn't work. I, I had a sound check uh, one time when uh, my uh, my standard on the sound check was to tune into every frequency with the TTI and look at it on on workbench, and uh, everybody else's standard is can you hear it right? Yeah. So uh, we we do one of the guitars. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, that's good. I go, no, it's not good because the backline tech had literally walked up and leaned, you know, like leaned on the receiver, basically. And I got two blue lights and nothing else because uh, I had a, a sub in for my uh, A2 that day. And the sub had patched into the other two BNC connectors on the back of that yeah, particular backline right. rack, uh, which is another thing. If you have multiple connectors, make sure they're labeled. And yeah. if they have connectors that aren't doing anything, make sure they're covered. You know. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, that, if you're close enough to a receiver, it will receive even with no antennas. Years ago, I was hired by Systems Wireless to run their New York office. So when I went down to their office in Virginia to uh, pick up the equipment and learn their methods. What they did is they would put a rack of, of wireless together, and then one of the people in the shop, their shop was located on the second floor with windows looking out on the street, would take a bag with all of the other transmitters and walk three blocks away. <laughs> and if they all worked, then it was considered good. Wow. All turned on at the same time. Well, yeah, but I mean, yeah, they talked into them individually, yeah. but the point oh. was that the RF got back to where it had to get 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 yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. you know. So there were a couple good points here: the Rigel DSA, the AIM UHF um, devices, uh, all yeah. I mean, the, all the good. Rigel is cheaper than a cheaper yeah. than a TPI, and it and it it's a full featured. It's great for me. value. Yeah. Tracking generator and with Which a. Which piece um, is that? It's a Chinese. Uh, Rigel R I G O L battery. That's a. Now it's, that's really yeah, a but it's not friendly for packing in your rollerboard, right? But yeah. um, you know, again, there are options, right? We're talking about shop. We're talking about prep here. 
Um, you know, and this is the most important thing. And and I think I your your point here when you're doing shop prep is about quantifying, right? Yeah, that I, that you know, encouraging people to get to that point, measurable. Yeah, I, I just had a comment that I wanted to make an hour or so ago. Uh when I was when when Ike was showing his spreadsheets where he was documenting uh the system, and I looked at the spreadsheet and my initial reaction was He's got a serious case of OCD. But then the more I looked at the Actually, spreadsheet, I have two cases and I, I keep them neatly stacked in the in the basement. But anyway, yeah, sure. But the more I looked at it, the the more I wanted to have all that information documented. Yeah. That that there really there's no such thing as too much document, documented information. It it was well, everything that was on there was an important piece of information. Well, you know, we, we, we learn this stuff by from problems, right? And and uh, when I parachuted into the Shania Twain tour in 2015, like my first day was the first load in. And um, so the RF system was a bit of a mess. And one of the things was, uh, you know, I came up with a new coordination and programmed it in. And all of a sudden the mandolin was like way too loud. And I'm like, what the hell is that all about? Well, what that was all about was that the that particular receiver was um, sending gain settings to the pack uh, as part of the sync thing, and uh, which is good, except that they had changed the gain in in the you know they had figured out that the proper gain for the mandolin pack was you know minus twenty three or whatever, and the receiver was sending you know zero or minus ten or whatever it was. And um, so I had to, you know, quickly figure out why every time I put a new frequency into the mandolin pack, it was getting louder. And secondly, you know, dig into the sync menus, find that and fix it. I mean, uh, I firmly believe that every receiver should have the sync settings to push to its transmitter for its particular role in the show that those things should that's, be programmed in. It's important to check your your yeah. IR settings in the yeah. receiver. Yeah, and um, because, because nobody else needs to know, like if a pack goes bad and you replace it, then it should do exactly what the other one was doing before it went bad. And it's not like, oh yeah, just give me a second to you know and, change this and change that, you know? So that's, I started documenting that stuff on one of these sheets as well. And, uh, you know, the sheets can get a lot bigger because of those IR settings, but it's definitely important to keep track of all that stuff. I noticed also that uh, I was always used to have all my receivers with zero dB out on the receiver. But if you do a factory reset on an Axion Digital, plus 12 is the normal output. So be careful about that. You'll be you'll get a lot of extra gain you don't know, know about. I kind of I kind of referred to that, and and I'll tell you, you know, there was a time in this industry when the women were tall and strong, and the men were all beautiful, and every Thanksgiving the Easter Bunny would come down the chimney and pass out excellent cigars to every man, woman, and child. And if you plugged into the output of a mixing console and you ran that XLR into the input of another device that you could be sure that they were at the right operating level before somebody came up with this thing of instead of saying you know plus four is the right operating level and you should stay around there we're going to change that to uh, we're going to tell you how far away you are from the barn burning down you know <laughs> that that we're going to, oh, okay, you're 18 dB below the barn burning down, everything turning to garbage because it's just going to clip like this. And except that there's no standard about where the barn burns down. You know, this device might clip at plus 22. That one might clip at plus 24. This one might clip at plus 20. 18 below that is three different numbers. You know, I, I hate the DBFS thing with a passion. Yeah, so, definitely. And yeah. and the other the other thing about gains um, is monitor engineers will always put out more audio than they told you they were going to put out. <laughs> so they're going to always overdrive their transmitters all the time. So 
So I, I I usually sneak in a few dB of loss into the into the input of a of an ear ear transmitter. Certainly, if I'm watching and it's go, going always into red, definitely. But uh, uh, AV trainer asks a question. Besides your analyzer and your software and your proper crimpers, what other tools would you like to always have? Um, I have a little pouch that uh, originally a uh, uh, radial JDI came in, and I keep uh, I have a, a small side cutters, a needle nose pliers, a multi bit screwdriver that's small enough to work as a tweaker. Um, there's a couple of specialized drivers. Um, for example, in the Sure UR2 transmitters, there was a, a little plate with the up down buttons and stuff, and there were two Torx screws that held those into place. They, and, got, uh, they fell off all the time. They would get loose. So I, I had one of those. Uh, I have a, a scissors and a paramedic scissors. Um, and uh, what I call an aproxo knife, which is just a little, you know, little uh, sliding blade knife. Um, yeah, just those things, uh, you know, just particularly with RF, um, often you're dealing with stuff that requires some little tools, but you should also have like a big slip joint pliers or something for when those uh, pipe clamps don't come off after the gig or something like that. Yeah. But yeah. I also, um, also one more of... thing. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. One more thing is um, I sort of intermittently carried uh, just a regular DMM with me. I've had various miniature ones and stuff like that. Um, and uh, lately I've gotten to the point, I have a little key sight now. And uh, if I don't take it with me on a gig, I invariably regret it. So a, a little a multimeter as well is uh, highly recommended. I have a couple of uh, one by three mechanical RF switches in my kit. If I just need to switch between two different places, a sort of poor man's antenna uh, 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 router. Yeah. Uh, John Christie suggests to add a round drink tray. And I think he's probably thinking of after the show. <laughs> but yeah, you want to make sure you go into catering and grab their yeah, uh, exactly. for, for moving around large, large exactly. amounts of transmitters, right? On top of the bus checks. Then besides being able to move your drinks around to where, where your crew is sitting, it's good to carry around all the wireless transmitters between different places. Yeah, Anthony brought up binoculars as well, which I thought, I think that's an interesting idea. Mm. You know, when you're in a... Um, an arena or you're in you know those yep. dark spaces where you're trying yeah. to see is that power light on or when you're old you know, and you're in the that, theater <laughs> or you're yes, just old. Yes. I also I also carry a small pair of binoculars with me that's true um yeah you know, if you're into computers um the the those those great screwdriver sets on Amazon now for well, with you know the little plastic things all in there, but you get every Torx, you know, cause a lot of times you're taking apart a laptop and replacing a battery, and then you're also fixing a transmitter housing. So a lot of those similar tools are, you know, having a broad selection of, of small bit types is really helpful. Um, there Especially was, if you've uh, ever taken apart a MacBook Pro. <laughs> yeah, there exactly. is that. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, James wonders why you need a tracking generator. He's just used a transmitter. Well, what's belt. the advantage, right? What's the advantage well, of a tracking generator? Well, the advantage, the tracking generator gives you the actual frequency response. I mean, it it sweeps, right. it will sweep it from sweeps a frequency in one end of the cable and, and then you'll display it the on the other side and actually right. gives you a, a spectrum readout of the frequency response of the cable. It, I mean, even a good cable is not likely to have flat frequency right. response. It's going to have... And dips and peaks in it if you're using an analyzer that's a 50 ohm antenna analyzer and you put a cable on it and you get a little wave diagram coming out you're measuring a 72 ohm cable you get a lot it looks like little waves because you've got the hmm. wrong impedance cable hmm. on your analyzer yeah generally uh, it's funny i messed around with this i i took some pictures but i didn't include them in the uh 
in the thing, but I actually had a, a cable downstairs that I was like really, really, really punishing, like destroyed it basically, just to see like what it took to get to see something on the analyzer. Uh, and it actually takes quite a bit, but at one point, and this is a piece of RG8X, uh, single shielded RG8X, um, I, put, I put it in the bench vise and clamped like a four inch section and and just tighten it up as much as I could so the cable was practically flat there. And for that, you would see, and, and this is like a 10 foot piece of cable, so there's not a lot of loss through the cable. For that, you would see uh, about a couple of dB loss and you would start to see the response get kind of wavy. Yeah. So um, it's, it's not, um, sometimes it's not really, super obvious but i mean i have also hooked up cables to test them and it's been like a sawtooth or something yes. and you go okay that's a bad cable <laughs> yeah 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 yep. i have a uh a, a key site uh firefox and it just is like your key site plug the cable into the input it's a single input device i don't have to use a tracking generator send it to my antenna and it measures not only the the return loss or uh, but also distance to fault so if there's a connector in the middle that maybe has a not perfect yeah, connection i, I need that a little that's hole field fox a little hole. and yeah. i'm i'm looking for one of those because uh i just this installation that i did last week uh i was checking some antenna cables and stuff and i was getting some uh, I'm, they're already installed. We're talking like, you know, anywhere from a catch. Okay. <laughs> uh, 175 feet, uh, anywhere from 175 right time, feet to 300 feet, uh, already installed. And I was, you know, checking them with the rig expert here and I was getting information that I couldn't really get the answers that I needed. So I'm actually looking for one of those now. And, because the Anritsu is a wonderful analyzer and I love it, but it doesn't do the distance default thing and it doesn't do the the uh, vector network analyzer, yeah, which is what yeah. that feature is. So it's really good, really good. Yeah. James yeah. Galen uh, Graylin points out you should, in your tools you should have plastic things, spudgers. Well, that was a lot more important years ago when we had to adjust the frequency of transmitters using a plastic tuning tool. And yeah. I probably still have a couple in my box, but I haven't used them in a billion years. You know, you mentioned something about an installation. I can, uh, uh, somebody made a note here about security screws, right? If if people, if you're going and working for a system integrator for a while, while you're off the road, things like that, you know, that, that, that besides the trumpeter tool, you know, the, the security screw, driver you know there's a lot of little unique bits that that yeah. um literally bits that are used uh, and so that's a good point that depending on where you're going into work you may need um to have a few of those different things a lot of those little uh, boxes that have like 30 different connectors uh, bits have the security screw versions of those bits in them so if you get yourself a little I have all that Ooh, stuff. Yeah. It's just yeah. because of my other life as an audio repair guy. I have a Pelican case that has a pretty complete electronic shop in it. Uh, soldering, desoldering, oscilloscope, test set, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. transistor and capacitor testers, multimeter, blah, blah, blah. It goes on parts, uh, sure. tools. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I had that with me on the installation last week, but because I... I don't take it on every RF gig. I, I don't even mention that stuff, but I own yeah. probably two sure. of every tool going. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we have no doubt about that. You know, it's uh... Jason, Jason points out that a, a sawtooth VNA sweep could be an indication of uh, a cable that's gotten twisted too much and the interior is spiraling. Uh, that's very possible. This uh, happened to be the very first cable that I ran out on this other uh, high profile gig that I parachuted into. It was one of the local receive antennas for backstage. And um, some months after I was having some trouble with it and I measured it and I saw that sawtooth on it. And I also looked and I saw there was a piece of 
of uh, black electrical tape around the end, and it was a little uh, minus six or something on it in uh, right. in, in <laughs> paint marker. And I thought, why would a 25 foot cable be minus anything? You know, <laughs> so 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 they were tested, but they just marked them yeah. as to what they tested at. So anyway, so that one went in the garbage. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So and Mark Mark Kennedy also says bring a spare pair of pair of reading glasses. I I buy them in three packs and I always have a three pack in my suitcase. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I mine aren't quite reading glasses, but I always have a couple of spares of old old glasses that where I've changed my prescription. Now one thing I will throw in there, I have a pair of prescription glasses where I had them turn the uh, the prescription ah. upside down, and so the the two thirds of the lens is for computer right so when i'm in a rack or i'm up on a screen i use that when i'm on the computer and then i have my other one so that i don't idea. kill myself in the car no uh, and that, that worked like really that well because uh when i'm lying on my back underneath the console like you know in a truck in a broadcast truck or something where i do maintenance on them i'm lying on my back underneath the console if you're trying to pick something that's up there and you've got progressive right. lenses Forget it. You can't see it. So uh, turning yes. the prescription upside down sounds like a great idea. Well, I just go like this. No. <laughs> I just turn Pete upside down when we're on the show, that and works. that seems to fix that the problem as well. The second question AV Trainer asked, is there something you can use electronically share paperwork so people you're working with are all on the same pages? I've switched over to using Google Sheets for all of my paperwork. Even if I don't share them with anybody, then if I do, we're always on the same page. I find most big shows that I'm on, there's already like a Dropbox or some sort of public uh, collaboration. Except Google Sheets yeah. keeps one document and you see all the changes and yeah. you revert them if somebody makes a mistake. Yeah, no, that kind of thing, like, uh, yeah, that, that show that I did with Ryan last fall had had something like that going, yeah, so. Yeah. Now, one thing I would like to point out, I made this note while you were talking about your paperwork, which I appreciated the high level of detail the same way Mac did. Um, I would like to share with people that a couple things, be courteous to the, the people that are giving you the paperwork, meaning if you find a form you really like, ask permission to borrow it from them. Um, don't just assume that because you were on the show that you know all the paperwork is necessarily it's public yours. domain. <laughs> Technically it is sort of, right? Yeah. Uh, you know that was my number one thing because you know people love to share obviously we've learned from Pete um, that uh, you know there's a value to that. Um, but be courteous, right? And and ask for that. The other thing is be sensitive to confidential information that inadvertently gets added to those documents. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we'll put in things because they're convenient, but if you go back and you read your paperwork later, you go, oh my God, you know, there was a lot of information that All was my buried with were in there. In exactly. there. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, uh, but you know, that those are the, the, the kind of things that this, this connectivity is great. Just remember that if your password gets compromised and your information gets hacked, um, that private information isn't necessarily private, kind of like when you put something in an email, um, uh, you know, and this is where that encryption comes in, right? So here's a question I had for you, Ike, I was thinking about as you were talking through your prepping your rack. Um, I've become a very big fan of turning encryption on on microphones. Uh -huh. um, that way I don't have to worry about, you know, when that executive or that special guest or whatever is, is being mic'd, has their mic on, I don't have somebody else on another receiver. Um, is that something that, you know, you would make a call on site that you would encrypt something, may not encrypt? Is that something you would do up front? What would that's you suggest? That, that's work? something that would generally be coming from higher up the food chain than me. You know, like management saying, you know, I don't want the artist, Mike, uh, to be uh, for anybody to be able to eavesdrop on it. The huge, huge, huge gap in that issue 
is that mm -hmm. the in-ear monitors, uh, unless they're using Electro Duet, are not encryptable. So good even point, if, right? Even, yeah, here I'm if, talking just about microphones. In this even if their even if their microphone is encrypted, um, mm -hmm. then um, it doesn't mean that what they're saying or what's being said to them or whatever can't be picked up by somebody with a yeah, absolutely 100 percent equipment right so so mm -hmm. the the encryption thing is kind of a it's kind of a neither here nor there right now because of the fact that that uh, as long as analog in-ear monitors are the standard it's not going to really be something that's, that can be gotten around well but if i have a but microphone that's a, that's on issue. somebody that's an issue in the concert world where you're using in ears. Yeah. But in the corporate world, very few in ears get used. Yeah. No. And in, in, in the corporate world, absolutely. And um, yeah, I'm, sure. Encryption. I, I remember. By all means. Yeah. I don't know. Thirty years ago, when Telex came out with a encrypted wireless, they were the first one ever. And uh, a certain no, computer, safe. three letter computer company. Um, insisted that all their executives because they would never use wireless mics previously they yeah. all microphones had to be wired for just that reason and so they said everybody had to use these encrypted mics and those uh those old telex units they sounded pretty horrendous <laughs> they were awful <laughs> yeah they... the telephone quality bandwidth yeah uh, kevin parish points out that bracky b-r-a-c-k-i-e manufacturing makes great custom cables, very inexpensive, in, including small piece orders, and times microwave cables are e excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He also Master brought up a point about... There. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he also brought also, up a point about RF spares. Now that, what? Um, Kevin brought up a good point about RF spares. We've met a lot of people over the course of this downtime in our industry. Uh, when you're on show site, reaching out to those people, right? That whether they're in the broadcast uh, team that you might be out with or with the live event or with anybody, a lot of times, you know, this I you made the point of going to the video department about the tool, right? Which happens to also carry a lot of antenna cable, but we can have that discussion later because uh, any port in a storm sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but um, the point is, is that our RF spares can sometimes show up in a lot of different areas. So uh, you mean, you mean uh, like in, in people's in people's personal uh, work trucks? Don't be, don't be. Well, <laughs> I, I think that his point was don't be afraid to go ask someone else oh. or to to walk across the aisle and go, hey, I got this issue. Can you help me out, right? Um, yeah. And folks that that use that. And yes, AV trainer, 75 ohm antenna cable. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying you're supposed to. I'm just saying sometimes if you have to. It's lower loss than RG58. And cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, um, go well, ahead. I was just going to say thanks, guys. I, I Again, I just so much appreciate you guys doing this for the industry in general and, and uh, and I appreciate really you having me on here and and uh, you know giving me this this uh, soapbox to stand on and tell people what to do you know or suggest <laughs> what to do you know and uh, um, you know hopefully it'll it'll all do something good for the industry you know so well that I agree with you you know the I appreciate you coming on, Ike. You know, the the first time I met you, I think we were having oysters in uh, in in New York. Uh, yeah. You were actually RF coordinator who had been hired to work on a show that I was doing, and yeah. Pete's like, "Hey, you want to come to dinner?" And and Ike's coming along, and you know, go figure. Yeah, that was really funny. We were probably at least halfway through dinner when when it. You know, well, what are you actually doing in New York? Well, I'm doing this show over at, you know, jazz. And I go, oh, yeah, I'm doing a show at jazz, too. Is it this? And, and yeah, we were on the same show. So it was, that was kind of cool. Come to find so, out I was mixing the show and you were the RF coordinator. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it, but, you know, the one of the biggest things I took away from this whole presentation, guys, is 
the ability to differentiate yourself through your attention to detail, right? That, you know, when we, when we talk about going back to work and we talk about um, where do we find our place in, in, in this world, um, but that is detail, information, um, that's the differentiator. And, um, you know, we can, we can spend a lot of time over shop prep and who gets the charge for it, who doesn't get the charge for it, and should I go in on my own dime? Um, those are all obviously valid questions and discussions, but that doesn't change the differentiation and the attention to detail. Whether you're paid to be in a shop or not doesn't affect how you coordinate and how you manage your information and your ability to interact with your team. So I took a lot away from that, Ike, that um, your detail, as Max said, the forms that you had, um, and then in today's COVID world, and somebody has to come in for me because I tested positive, man, what a what a ray of sunshine if I walked in with that pile of, of paperwork that you prepared, right? Yeah. 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 So, um, man, another week's done, guys. Yeah. Crazy. I, I I feel those circular drink holders calling me. So. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, before we go though, Monday's show, we're doing a two a day. We just couldn't resist. Sorry, folks. Um, you know, Pete said, Pete said, I need to be on the air more. Um. <laughs> No, uh, uh, one o'clock Eastern, we're doing a session with Carl Winkler, John Tatoulis of Sound Devices, and uh, Chris uh, uh, Hayward, who is um, a uh, uh, location sound mixer, production sound, the Ad Astra, he was part of that team. He was on Mandalorian uh, team, episode one. Uh, uh, SWAT, the TV series. So we're, you know, um, some folks had said, hey, what about location audio? Well, here you go. Location audio, we're going to do that at one o'clock. Then in the evening, right, Pete, we're doing 8 p.m. Eastern uh, for our friends over in Asia as well. We're going to do some more um, uh, GPIO. You started a little trend with your uh, with your Riedel uh, thing. We were said, jealous of my logic, my Riedel logic. Right. Thing. So, uh, so let's do it on Clearcom EHX, exactly. right? And exactly. so um, John Christie, though, from yep. yeah, above the border there, you hater. Um, he's going to be on with us, and um, so it's going to be him and Ram uh, talking about. Um, GPIO relay features with EHX, but then also continuing our discussion around EHX, right? Just kind of picking up where we left off. So um, Monday's a full day. So if you've got nothing going on, you should plan on spending most of the day and evening with us. Dinner will not be provided, but we will be taking a tea break. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I love, that I love tea the tea break the other day. That was the first one, wasn't it? I was it away was from my computer when it started, and I came back. Couldn't figure <laughs> out what was going on. English and taking a tea break in the middle of their <laughs> webinar. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I think it was for something that rhymed with tea, but she was too polite to say it. But um, I, I thought it was great. <laughs> it was, I don't know. I don't know. It was a long show. It's three and a half hours, that show. It was amazing. Yeah. Anyway. Absolutely. Uh, so, thanks, guys. Thanks again, Ike. Yeah, and thank you. Want to give us a spelling on the uh, Bracky cables because I think it's some folks bracky. were wondering about that. B I sent bracky. out a link to everybody already. Perfect. It's B R I C K I E manufacturing. If you Google you go. manufacturing, you get them right away. So cool. okay, thanks again, guys. Okay. Great week. Thanks everybody. Yeah. See you all later. Bye bye. See ya.